Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing. And the people stood by watching. But the leader scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Messiah of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him. This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he replied, Truly I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. Please be seated. And if the children can come forward, please. <clears throat> well, let's do something else. Come on up, have a seat, maybe. <clears throat> so today we're going to talk about kings. Do you know what a king is? What, Emma? What, what's a king? Someone that can rule the world. What else? Do you know what a king does, Tayden? A king says, you do this, and then you do it. Right? The king is in charge. What does a king look like? Emma says, I don't know. I never met one. <laughs> Good answer. So, here's Ed. Right? Hi, Ed. So, if Ed is going to look like a king, what does he need? What's one thing that he really needs? A crown. Oh, look what I have. I have Ed's crown. Tayden, can you come up here and help me? So put Ed's crown on his head. Make him a real king. Can you do that for me? Okay. Does he look like a king now? What kind of clothes is he going to wear? A cape. Does he wear shorts and flip-flops? No? Right? He wears a cape. Does he wear like fancy clothes and jewelry? Right? Does he have a lot of money? Kings are really rich. Now here's the interesting thing though when it comes to a king. Today, we're talking about Jesus being a king. But if you look at the cross up here, right, right here, does this look like a king? No, why not? He doesn't have a regular crown. What kind of clothes is he wearing? Not much, we'll just say, right? This is a different kind of a king. God sends Jesus to come live with us and be a different kind of king. This is the kind of king that comes to save us. This is the kind of king that comes to love us. This is the kind of king that wants us to all live together in peace and love and harmony. Ed over there, 
He's the kind of king that says, do this, and if you don't do it, you get in trouble. Jesus, the king, says, I love you. So that's what we're going to talk about later on in the sermon today, how Jesus is a different kind of a king. So let's come together. Missy, catch. Good one. Let's stand in a circle. We're going to do our prayer. Ah, it's okay. Oh. Did you know she was my first baptism? And she still looks at me like... So let's pray. Let's, um, congregation, please stand too and join in. So let's fold our hands. So repeat after me. Good morning, God. Thank you for today. Thank you for the sunshine and beautiful weather. But most of all, thank you for being a king that loves us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. I'm going to leave Ed right here. <clears throat> Thank you. So grace to you and peace from God our Creator and from our Savior Jesus the King. Amen. So who is Jesus? The scriptures tell us. We have the sacraments where Jesus comes to us in the waters of the baptism and in the bread and wine at the Eucharist. So today is Christ the King Sunday. So now you know who Jesus is. We say he is King now, if we lived during Jesus' time, would we dare say he's the king of the Jews when Rome was ruling over us? Would we say he's the king of the Jews when cruel Herod was king? Would we dare to publicly, publicly, publicly say Jesus is king when looking up and seeing him being crucified, and especially crucified next to criminals? So who is Jesus? So today we say he is king, but was he? He doesn't look like a king up on the cross. He doesn't act like a king. He forgives his torturers. Seems kind of weak to me. Kings aren't executed like or with criminals. Kings aren't spat upon and mocked. Jesus isn't like a king. Or maybe it's the other way around. But today we say Jesus is king. But not our human earthly idea or image of what a king should be or should not be. He's a king with supernatural power. Jesus is the victor, the defeater of sin, death, and the power of evil. Now that's the kind of king you want on your side, right? So for example, I'm a pastor, in case you didn't notice. And if a pastor is truly faithful to Jesus, then I'll be given all kinds of success. I'll live in a mansion. I'll drive a Rolls Royce. I'll have a private jet. And if you are faithful, Gary, he was pointing at me, I'm pointing back. Um, so if you are faithful, King Jesus will be on your side too. He'll take away every single pain that you're going to have in your life. He'll bless you with money and material goods along with good health. And you can get wherever you would like in life. Jesus is your magical savior. Who has seen the Wizard of Oz? This is the time of year, Thanksgiving, when they always show it, right? Remember the first time I saw it, the Wicked Witch freaked me out. So Dorothy, and her little dog too, 
end up lost and far away in the far away from her home in the land of Oz. And she's told the only one that can get her home back to Kansas is this wizard. So who is this mysterious, all-powerful, unapproachable wizard? And to add to this frightening and intimidating mystery of who is the wizard, Dorothy is required to do this dangerous task in order for her wish to be granted. Talk about anxiety. But it turns out the wizard is just some guy who ended up in Emerald City. Nothing special about him. He's a bit of a charlatan, perhaps. He does get her home, but she didn't need to do anything. She just needed to believe that there's no place like home. Now, I am not equating Christ with the wizard. Christ is not a charlatan. He was not a carnival showman in the least, but it's about the discovery of a true person. What's behind the curtain? Who's there? I believe our sin, those forces which separate us from God and from each other, has put up this curtain of illusion around Christ. We've turned Jesus into this magical vending machine. You put a quarter in him and you expect perfection in return. He's not a bottle of Windex where you spray it and everything is perfect and sparkly and brand new in an instant. Jesus is not a weapon to be used against others, to promote discord, to judge others, to beat others into submission. God pulls this curtain back that we have created and we see something unexpected. We see a broken body. Broken from crucifixion, broken from taking on all the world's suffering and sin that's dumped on his shoulders. We see a broken body which didn't survive torture and execution. This is a king. This is the son of Mary, the descendant of David, the Israel's greatest and most beloved king. This is the one destined to save Israel. Is this the same man who walked on water, healed the sick, raised the dead, exercised demons, this broken body? God pulls the curtain back even more, and then this light shines on this broken body, and it pours out over to this broken body, which overcomes suffering and death. This broken body is back. It's still scarred, but fully recovered. This this is God that's made visible. God who comes to us as a human being, lived as a human being, and died as a human being, and rose above all of that just so we can too. This, This is what a king looks like. Nothing like our literal and humanly narrow image of a king. This is a humble and caring king who knows our wretched lives but still is full of great power, power over life and death. This is a king who asked God to forgive his executioners. Earthly kings would never do this. This is a king who told a criminal there's room for him in paradise, that he would share paradise with him. I mean, what king would open up his palace to a criminal and say, come on in, my house is your house, live with me. This is a a king who wields power not through a sword, not through a gun, not through threats or insults. This is a king who wields power through love, forgiveness, and reconciliation. Now when I think of king, I think of glory, I think of pomp and circumstance, I think of The Crown on Netflix. Has anyone watched The Crown on Netflix? Oh, come on. Only one other person? Oh, two? It's awesome. It is so good. I love it. And when I see that, I see the glory. I see glory of palaces. I see coronations, funerals, state dinners. I see the way that servants act around royalty. But that's a human invention. That's Hollywood and its image of glory. God's idea of glory and kingliness is surprising. It's the opposite of our idea. 
glory is not pomp and circumstance. Glory is not gold or silver or mansions and private jets. It's not winning elections so you can be president. God's glory is found in love, forgiveness, and reconciliation. God's glory is found in suffering, death, and resurrection. It is found in everyday, small, mundane things. God's glory is feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, visiting the sick and the imprisoned, and forgiving our neighbor. That glory is found in Christ, who is truly king. Amen.